everybody we're gonna get started hello my name is Lindsay Johnson I'm here representing Rogers Urban Farm Lab today thank you so much for coming to our summer session webinar um, I just want to talk a little bit about Rogers before I get into things we have so many good sustainable programs and we're teaming up with a bunch of sustainability initiatives today to bring you our webinar we have um, an anaerobic digester which helps fuel a lot of different things um, in our campus and then we also have the composting program which is also used a lot on campus and we have mushroom research going on right now and that may turn into a business soon of growing mushrooms in coffee ground compost so we have a lot of different research and initiatives going on and today we're going to share some of those and we're also going to be collaborating with some other sustainable initiatives that you definitely need to check out but I'll get into it so we have Enid Partika as our first guest today, and she helps run the anaerobic digester on campus. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to her. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Enid Partika. I am a current uh, graduate student in chemistry. Uh, at UC San Diego, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the anaerobic digestion project that we've been working on. So uh, the last live stream, I showed you a little bit more about um, what we've been doing with our family scale hydroponic system. I showed you last time uh, how we put together the hydroponics and how we can inoculate a digester. Um, so today I'm just going to give you a little bit of an update of what we've been working on. Um, so. Lately, um, I've actually been started to, starting to use it for um, some research that I'm doing with the Dehean Lab at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, uh, basically looking at bioplastics degradation in anaerobic digesters. Uh, so we actually got an inoculation of digestate from uh, CRNR Environmental, which is up uh, in Riverside County. And um, from that, you know, we've been uh, able to um, produce some biogas. Um, so Pretty much, um, you can see that we've added um, a coat, uh, a blanket, if you will, of insulation around this digestion tank, and you may be wondering why. Um, so pretty much what the insulation does is it keeps heat in, and um, the reason why we're, we're keeping heat in, and we didn't have this on last time, is because um, the digestate, um, anaerobic digesters can either operate in mesophilic conditions, which is um, around 95 to 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, or they can operate in more thermophilic temperatures, um, which is closer to like 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it just, uh, that just means that you have a different, um, slightly different microbial community that is um, living in your digester. And um, the thermophilic uh, can be used if you want to 
um, process the food waste quicker. In the case of CRNR, um, they get a lot of yard waste, tree branches, wood chippings. Um, and so because it has a lot of cellulose, um, they kind of need that, that hotter temperature and those specific bacteria species to be able to um, break that down fast enough for them to then uh, sell it to uh, sell the fertilizer to um, to large soil vendors such as Miracle Row. Um, so yeah, this is operating right now. Um, has been operating at a thermophilic temperature of about 130 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. We've been doing that uh, with a heating element. So uh, down here, you can see that there's a couple of wires. Um, basically, this is a 1500 watt heating element, and yeah, it's quite a bit of power. Um, definitely raised the electricity bill a little bit, but of course, you know, this is just an experimental. Uh, this is the first time we've actually tried uh, experimenting with regulating the temperature. Um, and so pretty much, uh, this is just a mess of wires right now, but you basically have uh, your pump, uh, which we've just decommissioned briefly just because uh, some of the tubing ruptured. But basically, just imagine that there's tubes coming out here. It's connected to this, right? And you can basically uh, recirculate your digestate, make sure that your bacteria are getting lots of food all the time um, and are very happy. And uh, basically you also have a, a temperature controller. I'm just holding the little temperature controller box. I don't want to move around the wires too much. Um, a bit, pretty much um, here, right, the heating element connects and then uh, the temperature probe, which is on the other side, also connects. So the temperature probe monitors the temperature inside of this tank. Uh, relays it over to the temperature controller, and then it sends um, basically a, a signal to a relay, and that relay sends the electricity over to the heating element to either turn it on or off, depending on what the temperature is. Um, and so pretty much uh, that's how the temperature control works. And so uh, we've been experimenting around with that a little bit. Um, it's it's been, it's been definitely a bit of a journey uh, trying to make sure that uh, the heating element um, uh, is operating correctly. Uh, pretty much we had uh, a little bit of a hiccup when like our filtration media in here basically was moving around a little bit and it caused um, a little bit of disruption with the heating element. Uh, and so we had to basically readjust uh, where we put the, the filter media within the digestion tank. Um, and um, hopefully this weekend we'll get to trying that and we'll see how it goes. Um, we have, we've also, um, let's see. Talk about uh, the purification wall here. Um, so by purification wall, um, I mean that basically uh, the biogas, once it's produced, uh, needs to basically have the hydrogen sulfide scrubbed out of it. Um, hydrogen sulfide can be a toxic gas, and sometimes when your digester is starting up, um, it can produce higher concentrations of this hydrogen sulfide. So um, let me show this to you really quickly. So um, pretty much in back here, uh, maybe a little bit difficult to see, but you basically have uh, this biogas pipeline and it goes from like the white PVC pipe to the green uh, tubing and basically that will run all the way around here go through our biogas flow meter where basically uh, you can just press a little button here and it shows you the flow rate it shows you the amount of biogas that's been produced and you just keep going and um, there's a lot of wires here but I'll basically break it down uh, to the left here, we basically have this section that can get sectioned off. So right now, um, this is this valve is closed, um, but these valves are open. And the reason why that is is because we're trying to, um, as as the biogas um, accumulates, it will basically run through um, this tubing into the biogas bag that's back here. Uh, this blue uh, PVC bag and it'll fill up and once it is filled up to its maximum capacity then it'll register that on this pressure pressure gauge and 
the gas will be pushing against the water. So um, it may be difficult to see with the camera, but basically um, there's water uh, filled up to about here and it creates a bit of an airlock. Um, and what an airlock does is basically, um, it's almost like a pressure relief valve. So actually it, it is, it's simple pressure relief valve. So um, as your air pressure builds up, um, pretty much it once it equals uh, the pressure exerted by the water, then um, once it goes over that threshold, the gas will bubble out as um, a form of pressure relief. So um, the reason why that's important is um, that if you, you get too much pressure buildup, uh, you don't want something to rupture um, or potentially leak a bunch of gas. And uh, we anticipate that once this is full, we'll want to use it. Um, but this is, you know, a good safety precaution to have um, just in case if, you know, we don't get um, the time to use it all. Um, so that's how that works. Um, and if we want to uh, cook something from the biogas, we have this biogas pump down here. And we all we'd have to do is just turn this valve on, press, uh, turn on this pump, and the pump will move the biogas from this top section here and the biogas bag through the hydrogen sulfide filter, which pretty much consists of um, an iron sulfate. And then, you know, the hydrogen sulfide will react with that um, and basically form, um, form an iron compound inside here. And then um, basically after that, um, it'll just, the filtered gas will move up here to our biogas stove. And um, I say biogas stove, um, you don't have to necessarily get a biogas, a special biogas stove for this. Um, it can just be run off of natural gas. Um, or if you have a natural gas stove or you have two, uh, the special tubing that can adapt like a regular cook stove to natural gas, which is just something that you get at Home Depot, um, you know, that would work too. Um, but we decided to go with the, the model that already is built for, for biogas. So. Um, yeah, we could just turn it on and voila. Um, so as we accumulate gas, we'll be keeping you updated um, on that as well as on how, uh, how our experiments are going. And, um, you know, eventually uh, we'll be showing you guys uh, some, some cooking demos off of this thing, uh, which will be pretty fun. Um, so that's um, pretty much all the updates here. Um, one more thing, actually, um, it's been a while since uh, you've seen the hydroponics, so uh, we'll take a little bit of a shot of uh, how well that's been going. So we decided to grow some basil, some kale. Um, I, we had a squash in here, um, but we already harvested the flowers and like the little squash, um, so we took that out. But um, yeah, pretty much. Um, again, like I said before, uh, as the digest state accumulates, as we have more food waste um, to it, the bacteria will eat it up, um, more or less, you know, turn it into fertilizer, and um, it'll basically flow through here, uh, get aerated in our third tank, um, and the aeration just happens with an air stone, and you get, like, little micro air bubbles, um, and again, what the aeration does is just um, call the anaerobic bacteria, but also culture the aerobic bacteria, um, as well as convert, you know, your reduced compounds, um, like your ammonia and such into, uh, nitrates and just make, um, more nutrients readily available to plants. So, um, yeah, pretty much, you know, it'll plant the fertilizer here, pump it up here, uh, gravity feed it down. And so, yeah, uh, I've made a lot of tasty salads with this kale, um, and with basil. Um, in fact, you know, I might just eat a basil leaf just because. Just um, yeah, so it tastes good. It tastes pretty sweet. Um, we did an experiment with um, impact bioenergy and um, a school in Seattle where we basically had uh, the students test um, how basil tasted when grown with digestate at different pH levels. And they found that with the digestate overall it was sweeter. Um, 
which, you know, is kind of an interesting conclusion. It would be interesting to see if, uh, you know, we could replicate that study um, just with, you know, consumer surveys and um, maybe even analyzing, analyzing the plant itself. So, yeah, um, a lot of different opportunities with this. Uh, can't wait to make some more salad. Um, so, yeah, um, that's, that's about it here. Um, I hope that all of you are having a great weekend and I am happy to answer any questions that any of you guys have um, coming up in our, uh, our Q&A chat session. So, yep, have, have a great day everyone. Hello, thank you so much, Enid. Um, it was great having you. If you guys have any questions, just go ahead and put it in the chat or the Q and A, and we'll be sure to answer it. We're on. We'll be on here the entire webinar. Uh, next, we're actually going to have um, Enid's sister Eliza singing for us which is just such a good honor. She's super good. And um, we love to feature local artists on our channel. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to her. Thank you so much. Hello everybody. Let me get my camera up here to do start video. Hello everyone. So glad you're all here. Uh, for another one of our webinars and let me get started. Alrighty. When the rain is blowing in your face and the whole world is on your case, I could offer you a warm embrace. To make you feel my love When the evening shadows and the stars appear And there is no one there to dry your tears Oh, I could hold you for a million years To make you feel my love I know you haven't made your mind up yet, but I will never do you wrong. I've known it from the moment that we met. There's no doubt in my mind where you belong. I'd go hungry, I'd go black and blue. I go crawling down the avenue. No, there's nothing that I wouldn't do to make you feel my love. The storms are raging on the rolling sea and on the highway of regret. Winds of change are blowing wild and free. You ain't seen nothing like me yet. I can make you happy, make your dreams come true. There's nothing that I wouldn't do. Go to the ends of the earth for you to make you feel my love. Oh, yeah, yeah, make you feel my love. I heard that you settled down, that you found a girl and you're 
Married now, and I hope that your dreams came true. Guess she gave me things I didn't give to you. Old friend, why are you so shy? It's like you hold that. Oh, hide from the light. I'd hate to turn up out of the blue, uninvited, but I couldn't stay away. I couldn't fight it. I'd hoped you'd see my face and that you'd be reminded that for me, it isn't over. Never mind, I'll find someone like you. I wish nothing but the best for you to don't forget me. I'll pay. I'll remember you said sometimes it lasts to love, but sometimes it hurts instead. You know how the Time flies on me. Yesterday was the time of our lives. We were born and raised in a summer haze bound by the surprise of our glory days and I hate to turn up out of the blue uninvited but I couldn't stay away I couldn't fight it I hoped you'd see my face and that you'd be reminded that for me it isn't over never mind I'll find someone like you I wish nothing but the best for you to don't forget me. I think I remember you said sometimes it lasts in love, but sometimes and sometimes it hurts instead. Mm -hmm. Nothing compares, no worries or cares, regrets and mistakes, they are memories made. Who would have known how bitter sweetness would taste? Mm -hmm. Never mind, I'll find someone like you. Nothing but the best for you. To it all, forget me, I beg. I'll remember you said. Sometimes it lasts in love, but sometimes it hurts instead. Never mind, I will find someone like Nothing but the best for you to don't forget me. I think I remember you said sometimes it lasts in love, but sometimes it sometimes it hurts instead. Yeah, yeah. One more wants to fire that passes. All right, let's see. Boys walking on empty. Is that the kind of way to face the burning heat? I just think about my baby I'm so full of love I can barely eat 
There's nothing sweeter than my baby. We never want once from the cherry tree. Cause my baby's sweet as can be. She give me two thanks just from kissing me. When my time comes around, lay me gently in the cold dark earth. No grave can hold my body down or crawl home to her. Boys, when my baby found me, I was three days on a drunken scene. I walk with her walls around me. Nothing in a room but an empty crib. And I was burning up a fever. I didn't care much how long I lived. But I swear I thought I dreamed her. She never asked me once about the wrong I did. When my time comes around, play me gently in the cold, dark earth. No break can hold my body down or crawl home to her. Yeah, when my time comes around, lay me gently in the cold, dark earth. No grave can hold my body down or crawl home to her. And I guess one more quick one. Don't you worry there, my honey. We might not have any money, but we've got our love to pay the bills. And maybe I think you're cute and funny. Maybe I want to do what bunnies do with you, if you know what I mean. Oh, let's get rich and buy our parents' homes and the south of friends. Let's get rich and give everybody nice sweaters and teach them how to dance. Let's get rich and build a house on a mountain, making everybody look like ants. From way up there, you and I, you and I. Well, you might be a bit confused and you might be a little bit but baby, how we spoon like no one else. So I will help you read those books if you will suit my worried looks and we can put the lonesome on the shelf. Oh, let's get rich and buy our parents' homes and the supper friends. Let's get rich and give everybody nice sweaters and teach them how to dance. And let's get rich and build a house on a mountain making everybody look like ants. From way up there, you and I, you and I. So let's get rich and buy our parents' homes in the south of France. Let's get rich and give everybody nice sweaters and teach them how to dance. Let's get rich and build a house on a mountain making everybody look like ants. From way up there, you and I, you and I. From way up there, you and I, you and I. Alrighty, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eliza. That was beautiful, yes. as always. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna just head on to our next um, presenter today. This is this person is from 
uh, UCSD Computer Science for Agriculture, which is interesting. So go ahead and check out that student organization. And I'm sure she could put any of the social media links or whatnot below or in the chat. But um, for now, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Jasmine. Hi, um, so my name is Jasmine. I'm a computer engineering major at UCSD and I'm going into my third year. Um, I'm also a member of Computer Science for Agriculture, uh, CSA for short. Um, and today I'll be talking to you guys a little bit about what CSA is, what we do there. And then I'll be giving an intro to Arduino. It's one of the main components that we use in a lot of our projects. So I'm gonna start screen sharing. Okay. So first off, computer science for agriculture. Um, our main focus is to integrate technology with agriculture. And we do this by building sensor boxes. These sensor boxes consist of mixtures of Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, sensors, and other components. And we use them to take data from or automate projects. And we work closely with Rogers Urban Farm Lab and the students who have sustainability related projects over there. They are where we test a lot of these sensor boxes. On the right here, you'll see um, one of these boxes. This one is the box that we made for the digester system. And what it was programmed to do is uh, refill one of the reservoirs in the system once the water level got too low. Another one of our recent projects is the atmospheric and environmental monitoring drone. This is basically taking a commercial drone, putting one of our sensor boxes on it, and making it so that the sensors are interchangeable so that we can switch out sensor depending on the application. And with it, we can hope to do things like monitor tree health in the UCSD grows, um, measure the impact of sustainability research projects on campus or parking regulations, and also to map out pollutant hotspots around campus. Um, now do you, that you know what computer science for agriculture is, I'll go into uh, the Arduino. So the Arduino consists of multiple parts. It's the hardware, but it's also the software. And so I'm gonna talk about the hardware first, and then I'll be talking about the software later on. So what is an Arduino? A lot of people refer to the Arduino as a microcontroller, but that's not technically true. The microcontroller is this black box that I have outlined on the right picture here. And it's a device that is pro allows you to program it to perform a certain function. The rest of the board sort of allows us to interface with that microcontroller in a way that's simple enough that just about anyone can learn how to use it. So things like laundry machines, rice cookers, machines where you push a button or you flip a switch, and it performs a pre-given task, most likely contains a microcontroller. And the Arduino is just a DIY version of that. So this is what a board looks like. I'm not gonna talk about all the parts that are on here, but if you want to, you can look up data sheets and schematics on Google and learn more about it yourself. First off is the USB port up here. This can be connected into your from the Arduino to your laptop or computer. And this allows you to upload the program that you've written from your laptop to the Arduino. And then once you're ready to deploy your project, you can plug it into any standard power outlet. Another option is to use the DC power jack, but for CSA purposes, normally we stick to the USB port. Next, we have the pins. So on the right side, sorry, left side, you have uh, power source pins on top. You have the 3.3 volts and 5 volts. 
uh, depending on what components you're trying to power, you might have to choose between those. And then you have the ground pins. Below that, you have the analog pins. And on the right, you have the digital pins. Both analog pins and digital pins are data pins, meaning if you're taking data from, say, a sensor and bring it back to the Arduino, or if you're taking uh, values from the Arduino and sending it out to a screen to be printed out, this data travels through these pins. The difference between analog pins and digital pins are that um, if you're using data that is numerical, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, then you'd use analog pins. If you're dealing with data that's one of two values, high, low, on, off, you use digital pins. Next, um, we often use breadboards with our Arduinos because it's easy to build circuits. And when sometimes you have to distribute power from the Arduino to multiple components and there's only so many power pins, you'll need a breadboard to do that. And it's really nice for beginners because there's no soldering required and it's great for testing purposes. But if we were to deploy our projects, we would definitely want to solder it to a actual board because it's really easy for the wires to come, out, come loose. So the way the breadboard is connected is these um, the rails on the left and right side. Um, we have the blue ones, which are ground, and then the red ones that are power. And then you have the black ones in the middle that are connected horizontally. And what you can do with this is something like this. So if you have, say, you want power, you can connect it to the power rail right here. And then you'll see two more wires coming off of those power rails, distributing the power to the two separate components. And so I think that's about all for the hardware. Now onto the software. The Arduino IDE, also known as the Integrate development environment allows you to write code and then later on upload it to the <coughs> Arduino. And so if you want to download it, you simply have to look up Arduino download and it'll take you to this website and you download it. Once it's downloaded, you'll end up with a new sketch. This is sketch. Um, this is where you write your code. First up here, you see the setup area, and this is run once, once your Arduino is plugged into power. And then after that, it continues to loop through the code in the loop section, as long as it's plugged into power. What's great about Arduino is that they actually provide a lot of resources. So as you can see here, they have example, um, sketches that are pre-written for you. And this allows you to go to say liquid crystal display, that's a screen of some sort. And you can open up one of their files and they already have code written for you and you can see how it's run and then you can play around with it, build on it, use it for your own purposes, your own projects. Arduino also has what's called libraries. So that's packages of pre-written code that you can um, use. And it's really easy to go online and search up Arduino, um, let's see, LCD library. And it will pull up And then you can pull up the first link and it will give you all the functions you could possibly use with the art with the LCD component. And these are the examples that you saw um, up here. Those are the same examples. 
And so that's what's really great about Arduino. It's really user friendly. And if you want to learn something, it's super simple to just go online and look it up because Arduino is open source, which means everything's free online for you to look up and use. Another place to check out if you want to get some ideas on projects to work on is the Arduino Project Hub. And they have basically allows people to go on here and post projects that they've created. And they give you just about everything you could possibly need to recreate the project yourself. They give you the parts lists. So this one is a snake game. So I thought this was pretty cool. And they give you the code, they give you the sch schematics so you know how to wire everything together. And so if you do want to start learning Arduino, it's super easy and there's so many unlimited possibilities. And so we use, you can probably tell why we use this a lot in CSA. It's really malleable. We can use it to take temperature in a greenhouse. We could use it to um, monitor humidity, soil temperature, and then actually um, have it do something as a result. Like I said, with the digester box, it read the water levels and then it um, refilled the tank once the water level got too low. So one of the projects that I'm currently working on is um, a gas sensor called an MQ2 sensor. And so this is code that I found um, and I've been sort of manipulating it, playing around with it, um, trying to get it to basically give me data. And so the MQ2 sensor can um, detect LPG, CO, CO, and smoke. So here at the top, you have the libraries. And those are, again, packages of code that are you can basically find online and download and use. And OK, um, I can now uh, show you guys the circuit that I have. I'm going to stop screen share. So. This is the MQ2 sensor. I have an LCD here, the breadboard, and the Arduino. And as I mentioned before, these wires can come loose pretty easily and be plugged back in really easily as well. And so once Going back to my code, I can press upload. Verify is basically checking your code for any errors. So you can click, and it's like compiling sketch. And then if you hit upload, it uploads the code to the Arduino. And now I'm switching back to the camera. You can see that's, there you go. I have data being sent to my LCD screen here. And I do have numbers showing up, but I've yet to calibrate it and see if this is uh, accurate. Part of it is also getting the data into a form that we can actually analyze. Because right now it's giving me numbers, but what I want to know is um, how much percent of a gas is uh, in the air and things like that. Um, there's one more thing I was going to show everyone. Um, I think that is about 
Oh. So if you guys do want to learn about the Arduino more, there's a lot of resources online. So I wish you guys the best of luck learning about it. And I guess I'll hand it back to Lindsay. Cool. Thank you so much, Jasmine. <laughs> um, perfect. So our next performer is going to be the person who talked to you about anaerobic digestion earlier today, Enid, and she will actually be playing violin for you. So I'll go ahead and hand that back to her.
Thank you, Enid. <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, so for our next presenter, we actually have a guest speaker for us today. His name is Ramiro Lobo and he's with the UC Extension for Small Farms and he specializes in small farms and agricultural economics. So we just wanted to pick his brain a little bit on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and get those videos set up. I think Zach, you should be able to and then um, if we can just. Hi, Lindsay. I'm unable to start my video, but I was able to mute my mic. Okay, perfect. Um, Zach, would you be able to make Mr. Lobo a co-host, please? So yeah, I think he's probably setting up for the next segment. I'll go ahead and check in on him. Okay, uh, while we're waiting for this, I can, I'll just go ahead and go over the schedule there we go oh you got it okay perfect can yeah. you make um mr lobo a co-host please oh yes thank you All right, and now that you're a co-host, you should be able to put on your video. Okay, there we go. Nothing changed. <laughs> and then whenever Zach's ready, he'll begin with the questioning. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, by the way. My pleasure. Let me know how you want to proceed. I think Zach's just getting set up, but you should start in just a moment. Oh, sorry about that, folks. All right, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, sir. All right. So I've got some questions here. Had a bit of a lighting debacle right there. The sun keeps moving on me. Um, I mean, first, let me just state the obvious. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm not sure how much you, I'm not sure actually if you remember me, but I actually first met you at a GFI presentation that you made uh, here at UCSD. It must have been two to three years ago. And the, uh, I guess, sort of gestalt of your work that you do and the problems that you encounter and the sort of uh, perceptions you picked up along the way really stuck out to me all these years later. And so I just want to commend you for leaving such a lasting impression in my mind. And it's one of the reasons why we sought you out today. So I just want to preamble with that. And I also want to give you a chance to kind of explain what you do uh, to the people watching. Uh, the only thing we really put down on our interview thing was that you're the small farm advisor uh, with the UC Cooperative. And I thought maybe in your own words, you can describe a little bit about the work that you do and really why it's important. Yeah, certainly. A uh, pleasure to be here, and I'm glad to hear that uh, you that I made an impression on you, a positive one, that is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my uh, my name is Ramiro Lobo. I uh, my my job, my official title is a small farms and ag economics advisor, and I am affiliated with the uh, University uh, University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources, uh, from which the uh, UC Cooperative Extension System is managed. So in a way, we operate as, a, as the 11th campus in the UC system because we are sort of uh, treated as, as such, although we, are, we don't have a, a physical presence. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I was just, uh, I have a wonderful assistant here who's helping me and I didn't quite boost the volume enough, but you are a little uh, bit quiet uh, as well. Okay. 
There, there we go. Oh, that's much better. My, my microphone, I think, was hiding or, under my chin. Um, so, uh, yeah, we are uh, pretty much like an 11th campus, although a virtual one, because uh, we, we, we do depend uh, from the office of the president in the UC system. So as far as a small farm advisor, what I do, um, uh, give you an, a little bit of an overview of our, uh, about cooperative extension. You see cooperative extension is, uh, is associated with the land grant system. And what it is, is we do research and, uh, on uh, local issues uh, to help local farmers. And we have a presence in all counties in the state, uh, one way or another. So in many ways, locally based uh, uh, extension faculty as I am, uh, we pick up on local issues that need uh, research and then we, uh, we do conduct research sometimes by ourselves. Sometimes we bring these uh, issues up to, to, to some of our you know, campus-based specialists, uh, whether at UC Riverside or at Davis or Berkeley. And then we try to find solutions for these local problems. In other cases, it is uh, statewide programs or statewide issues that kind of uh, you know, come up somewhere else in the state, and then we try to funnel that information down to our local clientele in a way to kind of give them a heads up or to, to expand uh, to do education about these different programs. So, so it works kind of a both ways, from the local level to the state level and vice versa. In my own program, what, uh, what, what essentially what we try to do is we are sort of a gateway to the larger UC uh, agriculture natural resources system by uh, by uh, by this symbiotic relation. I mean this two way street that I described earlier. So in my own particular uh, research and extension program, I've uh, I try to emphasize to focus on local needs of farmers in San Diego County. And uh, based on the needs assessments and interaction with local growers, with the stakeholders, over the years, I've sort of identified uh, six areas that uh, kind of I've based, uh, I focus my program on. And those are, I try to do some work on business and risk management education, trying to help farmers become, you know, small scale farmers to be better business managers, to, uh, to sort of they mitigate some of the many risks associated with agriculture. As you know, agriculture is one of the riskiest businesses there are, and, um, and it's the classic example of, uh, you know, free entry and exit when you talk about, you know, an economic class, it's just because of, uh, people come in and go based on, on their success or lack thereof, you know, depending on what they choose to do. Then I've also worked, uh, done some work on uh, market development, and, um, and uh, this is through the promotion of agricultural tourism and direct marketing. And, uh, and we started working with this in 1998 on the ag tourism forefront. And uh, San Diego today is one of the uh, leading counties in terms of agricultural tourism activity based on the number of farmers that are involved with that as a, as a revenue generating uh, source. <clears throat> Another area that I work on is uh, trying to look at the evaluation of uh, evaluation and study of new crops to San Diego County. Again, we're trying to look for alternatives, you know, to, for growers to diversify into and, uh, and perhaps replace some of the local crops like citrus, avocados, and some of the other crops that are really uh, high uh, water in users and uh, whose pro profitability has declined mainly because of uh, foreign competition. So as part of that project or program area, I've, uh, I've been able to collaborate with many other colleagues and we've uh, started out, you know, with the blueberries is an example of the crops that we sort of introduced as part of that program or that effort. Uh, I personally introduced dragon fruit as a commercial crop for Southern California, and that is pretty much established now as, as an alternative for smaller scale growers and uh, water efficient crop, if you will, with high profit potential. Um, now the, my, my background is a, it's a coffee farm and, uh, coffee is the one crop that we are sort of doing research on uh, these days, because there's been a kind of a, a growing interest in coffee as a potential crop for San Diego County. And it types really well with some of the other marketing efforts that we're doing related to ag tourism and direct marketing, because we think coffee alone won't do it, but when you combine it with some of these other, uh, mar uh, marketing, um, strategies i think it works it may work quite well for 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 some farmers you know not all solutions work for every farmer 
<clears throat> then uh, I also try to educate new entry growers, people who are new to San Diego County or new to agriculture. Usually I, those calls come to me and uh, I try to uh, play devil's advocate and uh, drill them, you know, with hard questions about why they want to get into farming and, uh, and so on and on. So we offer, again, uh, access to information. You know, we don't recommend the specific crops or, or, uh, or make decisions for people. They, we, we provide all the information or as much information as we can for them to make a decision, you know, based on, the, on their assessment of, of both their ability as farmers and the resources they have. Um, uh, another program area is IPM and pesticide safety. Again, trying to secure, you know, the, uh, the food that comes to, that goes out to markets. Uh, we try to educate farmers about uh, both the conscientious use of uh, pesticides. We know agriculture, you cannot do it all organically. And, and, and even for organic pesticides, you know, there, is, uh, there are some risks associated with it. So we try to educate farmers about following proper, you know, the labels and proper protocols for, for using, for applying them and or disposing of, uh, of uh, you know, containers and all that. And finally, the, the final area has to do with food safety. We're trying to educate growers about complying with uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act, FISMA. And so we are uh, just collaborating on a project with CDFA to do some uh, education along those lines. So in a nutshell, that's sort of what I do specifically. Other colleagues do, uh, you know, specific crop. Uh, they have like crop assignment. I mean, they become specialists on an individual crop. In my case, I don't have a crop assignment, so I work on a multiple on a multitude of crops. And uh, because of what I do, uh, it also applies to farmers of all scales, not just small scale farmers, but some of the stuff we do benefits uh, larger farmers as well. Very interesting. And so theoretically, I could go and become a farmer tomorrow and I could reach out to you in your office uh, or the UC Cooperative as a whole and get useful information and advice on how to best go about that, correct? That is the idea, yes. And uh, ironically, though, you know, to become a farmer, but, you know, all you need to do is say you're a farmer. You know, I mean, I tell people it's not like you are a, you have to graduate of, out of a program. Uh, to, to become a farmer. But yes, I mean, we help you with information for you to decide what to grow at what scale and, uh, and pretty much where. Although, you know, where it's, uh, you, people come to us usually after they purchase land. Very rarely people engage us early on, you know, when they are trying to locate a piece of land to grow a specific crop. It's usually, uh, they come to us after they have made a quote unquote real estate decision on, on whatever parcel of land they buy. So once they've invested the big money and then they all of a sudden they want that input. They want, become, they want to become farmers. Yes. I mean, well, that's kind of something people, that struck know, there me. Are, there, there are some people that come out, you know, the other, usually we see younger farmers who don't have, you know, and this is something I was going to touch on later on, but uh, younger farmers who try to, to find a piece of land, you know, to, because they want to get their feet wet into farming. So they, uh, they start just kind of looking out for that piece of property that will be available for them to use. Well, it's young people trying out the farming trade, but I'm sure there's some older people who are throwing some money around thinking they're going to make some smart investment. Do you often see people investing in agriculture almost as if it was some other stocks or some other, uh, I guess, investment opportunity? Well, you'll find it's funny, but a lot of people, because of the economics of agriculture in San Diego County and uh, specifically the price of land and, uh, and, and other productive inputs and water, the, the people who can buy land in San Diego County are people that typically have made money somewhere else uh, in some other industry. And like I said, you know, they, they, uh, they get sold into a piece of property, whether it is a house with uh, two, three, four, five acres or a parcel of land that they are buying in a way speculating on real estate and then they want to become farmers so the thing is the funny thing is that most of these people you know they 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 sort of lose their business savvy you know when it comes to agriculture and they don't think it is real money they are playing with uh you know when when when, when trying to decide what to grow so it is uh it is a sort of a rude awakening because agriculture is a cultural industry no question about it and uh and the thing is when you come and you uh, into the into the industry, you know, there is people with uh, plenty of expertise out there who've been doing this for a significantly long time, and they know how to do it. So you you are at a 
competitive disadvantage from the start, you know, the, depending on, on, on what you get into. So that competition, where does it derive from? I see these articles talking about how the nation's farming force is growing older and older, that we don't have the replacement numbers. But when I look at, I guess, sort of the free market of food, there seems to be quite a bit of competition and attempts to undercut one another. Is the food economy sort of a sort of in different sort of sectors? Is it kind of separated or does everything sort of affect everything else? Will, you know, an investor from China uh, cause a destabilization in markets in California and vice versa, would there, if there was an environmental disaster in the farms in China, would that create ripple effects into the California, United States uh, farming market? Well, yeah, I mean, all of the above, uh, there is a globalization of, of, of uh, foods, if you will, you know, and typically a good year in farming in a, in a region of the country is the result of a tragedy or a natural disaster somewhere else. Uh, in general speaking, for example, you have a freeze in Florida in the spring, you know, their tomato crop goes to uh, goes to waste and then is a great year for tomato growers in California. Yeah. And uh, and vice versa, you know, we, we have drought years or, or, or avocados uh, growers are forced to, to implement water cutbacks, mandatory reductions in water use. So they're all, all of a sudden their water and, the, and, and their and their yields are sort of impacted by that restriction. And, and so the, the, the then uh, imported fruit takes a, a, a more uh, prevalent role, you know, in the, in the distribution system. But, but it has more to do with how you market, you know, the, the, the food, the marketing, the food distribution system in the U.S. is global. Uh, I'm not sure if you had a chance to go to the uh, terminal market in Los Angeles or any of the terminal markets, and you will see that you can find just about anything from anywhere in the world. And for consumers, you know, I think uh, we, we don't value food. Um, we don't place enough value in food to be willing to pay that little extra, you know, for, say, locally grown food or, or, or California grown food, uh, you know, however you define local. So uh, consumers want the cheapest food, uh, you know, the, the best food at the lowest price, you know, and, and that I think it is a... Uh, it is, uh, in a way, the keys of death for, for the, I mean, you had some of the other questions yet yeah, for the local food systems, because <laughs> what, what I see with local food systems is we're try, we try to be everything to everybody. You know, I mean, we try to, 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 to get the growers to get the highest price or a decent price, but we want the consumer to have access to that food at the lowest price. And so the question is, who's making up the difference? You know, I mean, in my, in my job, we try to tell growers, hey, you know, sell as direct to consumer as you can, so you get the highest price for what you sell. I'm not, I'm not advising growers to sell at the, at the cheapest available pr possible price because then it's not sustainable for as, as a farming enterprise. And, and so there are two kind of a competing goals here that, that, that we've got to find a way you know, to, to solve. And I don't think it can be solved but without public investment, quite honestly, because somebody's got to come in and make, that, make up the difference between trying to, to provide a decent price for farmers so that they can remain economically viable and then uh, trying to make that food, that locally produced food available to, to local to consumers, you know, at a, at a reasonable price that is accessible to most and uh, to, to, to reduce, you, you know, uh, hunger or, or, or food deserts, if you will. Well, that definitely touches on my follow-up question and kind of this um sort of greater issue, I guess, the Global Food Initiative and a lot of the, well, institutions like UC are doing right now and looking at is this uh, food disparity and how it's linked to social inequality and how do we go about creating a system of food that's not only socially just, but also economically just and environmentally just as well. So that's certainly a bit of a trifecta to have to pull off. And it sounds like or rather, maybe I'll get your opinion on this, uh, is kind of what's the solution to this? And you've sort of mentioned that the government's going to have to figure out what its role is and what to support and what not to support. And that's kind of then falls up to a, another question of mine is, if the government does support, um, what's, the, what's the best bang for the buck? 
where should that support go? Should it be more into these large agro farms that can just start churning out lettuce at 10 cents a head retail? Or is it better off going into building up these more localized small farms? And to give a little bit of a background context, uh, personal experiences, we're trying to look at if we can produce all the vegetables that UCSD needs from here at UCSD. And we're finding that it is almost uh, impossible. Number one, because of climate, we're in a very coastal microclimate, which is good for some things, but not really large scale uh, agriculture, the same way like, let's say UC Riverside might be set up for it. UC Riverside also has a lot more available land. It's a lot cheaper. It has better access to water and on only that, but it's not covered in eucalyptus trees, uh, preventing any sort of agriculture to go. And what we've started to realize is that we really should be, for every $100 we invest into growing food at UCSD, we can grow one pound a week, let's say. That same $100 invested into UC Riverside can grow 10 pounds, 100 pounds of produce each and every week. And we're starting to realize that while it may be more sustainable to grow our own food here at UCSD, we're finding that we can't grow it nearly as efficiently as UC Riverside. And the inefficiency of needing to drive up there and pick up the produce is still a lot less energy and time and fiscally uh, disadvantageous as it is to try to just produce it ourselves. Is this a similar, what we're experiencing trying to grow our own food and realizing UC Riverside really should be the centralized food producer? Is this sort of the reality of the situation that we're seeing on a national scale and maybe the number one problem facing localization? Ah, that's a, a lot in that. <clears throat> yeah, I know. I can reduce I, I, that a little bit if you need. <laughs> well, what, what I would say is, uh, I mean, if you want low price food then you know specialized monoculture farms are the way to go but in a way and, and and no question i mean that we are really good at that in california and and i would say the u.s is really good at that and that's why oftentimes we have surplus of just about anything that we grow you know intensively or extensively i should say the problem is that 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 has been sort of the genesis of the problem you're describing i mean and that is that sort of created the disconnect between you know, the farmer and the consumer. I mean, I mean, to the point that people say, you know, who needs them farmers if we got grocery stores, right? I mean, because everything that comes out of, say, these larger farms, which, you know, play a, a key role, you know, to feed people or, 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 or U.S. City, people in the U.S. and the world, if you will, if you want to extend it. But the thing is, local agriculture Yes, it is going to be costlier. You won't be able to compete with those farms because you'll have to find different marketing channels. I mean, if you grow, I mean, in, 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 I mean, once you go up in scale, say from one to ten to a hundred acres, your marketing strategy has to be different. I mean, uh, with small scale farms, oftentimes you are diversified and you are selling locally. And what I tell people is, uh, you know, sometimes we need to grow crops locally that help us not only provide a revenue for the business, but also help us build community, uh, help us build awareness about education, help us build awareness about the important, I mean, think of San Diego County and, and, and visualize it without any avocado groves or any citrus groves. I don't know how much you've traveled into the Valley Center or the Inland Valleys. And, and, and my golly, I mean, it would be a desert. So just the, the environmental contributions that agriculture make, you know, to San Diego residents, to the quality of life are huge, but they are not usually quantified. People take them for granted. They don't get any value at all. So, Yes, the, and the cost for this food is going to be perhaps a little bit higher than if you buy some imported, say, peaches coming in from Chile or South America or what have you. They are not going to be as fresh. They, they, and, and so there is a, to me, the solution is sort of a, a tier system where you support local agriculture just because uh, the values extend beyond the economic value of food produced. I mean, it's it is the contributions to, 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 to society. With, uh, they diversify the food system, diversify the diet, the, the ethnic, the cultural contribution that, uh, that these foods make because they, they are usually produced by ethnic farmers. 
And, and so there is a whole lot more into a local food system than the actual economic value of the food that is being sold or, or produced. And that's where I think those should need some support, those small scale growers, uh, in the sense that to make up that difference, or on the other hand, we need to educate consumers about, you know, th that local food is a differentiated product. It's not just food. I mean, it's, it's got a, a more value because of all the intrinsic elements that come along with it, you know? And so people may be more willing to, to, to pay a higher price for that. And, and people are, you know, way back when we started working on actorism, we, do the, we did a sort of a willingness to pay type study and ask people if they'd be willing to pay more for local food. And, 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 and you know, 50% of people say, yeah, we'd be willing to pay more. Then we drilled the, that question into consumers and how much more would you be willing to pay if you knew something is labeled as locally grown? And, you know, and that, by that we meant San Diego grown. You know, and they say, well, anywhere from 10 to 20%. Uh, with, the reality of it is, you know, with most willing, they, willingness to pay uh, studies, you know, the, it's hard to, you never see it in practice, the way people respond, uh, you know, when, we, when, when you do the studies. But there is an intention there to support local farms, to support local agriculture. And, um, and I think we should uh, do a lot more work on that and hammer that part and also try to support these local farmer movements because they, uh, they do more than just produce food. They, they help sustain, you know, the, they bring us back to basic and basics and sustain, you know, all a bunch of other elements that are not captured in the price of a head of lettuce that is grown in the Salinas Valley, for example. Interesting. So it really sounds like there's not going to be any one silver bullet to deal with the issue. And it's really going to be sort of a confluence. It's sticking to large scale agriculture where it's applicable, uh, trying to bolster and encourage local scale agriculture, ideally where it's desired. And then sort of on the in between, it sounds like marketing. Uh, and getting people to kind of actually put their money where their mouth is uh, and actually do something about it. And it's kind of interesting because I've looked at kind of what past other civilizations and countries have done. And sometimes for them, they fix that problem by simply mandating that the people now can only access their local market of food in an attempt to force people to start buying locally made. But then that comes in with all sorts of other sort of chain reactions and really sort of social political issues as to the role of government at that point. And so it's kind of interesting to see, and I guess your opinion on this, is America sort of unique in that regard, or are there other countries that have kind of figured this out? Or is America's unique situation kind of force it to find a unique solution for itself? Or, and vice versa, is what's working right now actually a good thing, it's just, uh, with the global population and how everything is sort of changing population density, is that kind of where the issue is stemming from? I kind of gave a lot there again. Well, I think uh, the solutions, yeah, there is no silver bullet for sure. And, and some of these problems have to be solved locally. I mean, you were comparing UC Riverside and UCSD, for example. I bet you what you can you can grow some things in open fields in uh, in UCSD at UCSD that you cannot grow in Riverside, and vice versa. Uh, or, or, or but but then if you use if you apply technology, which is I think offers a lot of opportunity for us here, and I see, and by that I mean controlled environment type agriculture, you know, and uh, and a lot of the systems that go along with it. I think those are opportunities for in, for incrementing local food production. And perhaps at a much more efficient uh, rate, and, uh, and and that can translate into uh, into lower prices, you know, for 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 food. But but again, you know, it, it it's um, we talk about you know Mediterranean diets. Uh, you you know, I've read about you you read about markets and how the the, the produce marketing works in Italy and some European Mediterranean countries. But they're the, the, the buying habits of people. People buy for the day. You know, you don't. You don't go. You, I mean, there's hardly any bookstores or where you go buy. You know, six heads of letters. You know, because that's the smallest pack you can get. You know, and and so there you go there and you buy your your daily needs for for whatever produce or whatever you want to cook on a daily basis. 
But the U.S. is not set up for, you know, like that. And, 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 um, and, and so our, our buying habits are different. You know, we want to shop for groceries. I would say people do it at most once a week, you know, and, and some people try to, to do it once a month, you know, I mean, and, 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 and anything in between, except for those who shop at farmer's markets, you know, where, where, this, where the farmer's market, it's, it's sort of a, a social event uh, in addition to getting uh, food for, for, for the week. But, but we can see, but we see that farmer's market represent only a minute portion of, of the total food market in, in the U.S., so there, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but there is a lot of uh, potential things that can be tried, and uh, and 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 all. But my my my, my thinking is this is going to be a local solution because every site is going to be different. We cannot find a kind of a cookie cutter approach solution to this, you know. And in San Diego, locally, I mean, we can grow just about anything we want, but you know, because of the weather, it allows us to do that. Definitely answered my question, and it was, my question really was just sort of a reaffirmation if this sort of broad mixed approach would work. And you affirmed that we do have sort of a deeply ingrained uh, cultural relationship with food here in America that's a lot different than places like Italy and Europe. And then that being said, America is far more spread out, and where the food is grown and where it's distributed versus how it's done in Italy is probably no doubt. Uh, quite different mm -hmm. um that kind of let's see i was leading into one of my other questions and i started thinking about italy and i was like oh, that sounds like a nice place to visit um your recommendation so there is these different scales of agriculture uh it's kind of a mixed bag san diego has a little bit of access to everything let's go back to what i was early, earlier saying how let's say i want to join farming tomorrow is the advice that you would give me as a starting farmer different if I was going to start a nanoscale one acre versus a 10 acre versus a hundred plus acre? You already sort of mentioned that the marketing is going to be much different between these different scales. Is there anything investment and skill wise that I would also need to take into account depending on these different scales? I would say yes. I mean, the, the, the uh, escalation from one to, to, to 100, uh, Generally speaking, if you want to get into one acre farm, you know, you're mostly going to be a, a diversified farm. You're, you're going to have a mixed bag of goods because your chances are you're going to be selling direct to consumers. You're going to be, you know, trying to start a small CSA or approach it, you know, through small through farmer's markets. But chances are you're going to be growing um, uh, a, a mixed bag of, uh, of items. So um, the skill set, I would say yes. The the uh, starting with the uh, with the, the business ability. I mean, uh, in a, in a one acre farm, you are it. You're it, it's a one man shop, generally speaking. You know, on a on a one hundred acre farm, chances are you're going to have the resources to buy expertise, to outsource some of that, so you don't have to do everything yourself. Uh, a, a one acre farm is going to be diversified. A 100 acre farm is usually go, it's probably going to be a sort of a monoculture, you know, or larger plots of specific crops that you are going to grow, depending on, 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 on location and what it is that you grow. So management skills, marketing skill, the ability to grow things, because like I said, in a, in a one acre farm, you are going to be the grower, you are going to be the manager, you are going to be the pesticide applicator, you're going to be you're going to do everything. So your skill, uh, your, your, your knowledge requirements are going to be huge, you know, compared to a one acre to a hundred acre farm. Um, chances are that your, your, uh, your use of technology on a one acre farm is going to be higher or your need for you because it can help you, you know, market your farm and what you do to social media, you know, whereas farmers, uh, uh, are larger farms are going to be, marketing through marketing boards or, or, or there is channels already established for them that they can pretty much just pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, I got uh, 20 acres of avocados ready to be picked, come and get them. And the packing house will send a crew and take care of that, you know, in most cases. Um, the uh, personality, you know, when, when you talk about people skills, you know, when you're a one acre farm, 
you are going to have to learn how to schmooze. You know, you're going to have to interact with people because you're going to be your 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 financier. You're going to be dealing with everything. So you you have to have the skills to, to that allow you to do that. And then is your risk attitude. You know, you you are going to have to just go with uh, with your guts in many cases. You know, because you won't have the time or resources to say do R and D. Okay, do I want to plan a plot of this specific vegetable? Then you're just going to go and try it. You know. And uh, and there is a grower in San Diego who who uh, as far as prices and all that, and I wish all farmers uh, you know had the ability to do what he does because one of I mean his we asked him about what his pricing strategy was and he said, well I'll plant a little bit of something you know and if I set, you know and I'll set a price and if I sell out, I will double the amount planted and double the price, but he he grows you know. He's got a reputation for growing really excellent produce, and he doesn't grow enough of anything because people are all over his produce and, and vegetables and fruits. So, yeah, I think though, I think there are different skill uh, skills required. No question about it. And and mostly related to the ability or lack thereof to to outsource or to buy expertise from others. You know, because like I said, a one, one acre farm. It's a one-man shop with lowest capital requirement, a larger acre farm. You're going to be working w- w- more with, uh, with uh, probably loans and uh, more capital investment. And, uh, and you will have to out, you know, hire contracted labor, contracted everything to, to sort of do what you need to do. And, and, and the escalation you know, will happen as you move up to, from one to 100 acres. I mean, the, the, the needs are going to change drastically as you move up. That's really interesting. It really it does seem like the difference between being a good manager and organization skills versus, like you said, can you be this, you know, one person show that can just do it all. And so in some ways that I would think that doing that 100 acre plus farming would be a lot harder. But in some ways, it almost sounds a little bit easier because it's a lot more turnkey, I guess you could say, whereas if you do just a single acre, there's tons of nuances that then go into the process. And then sort of speaking to the, going into the large scale, uh, the part about labor, uh, it sort of reminded me of the last interview we did with Richard Zapian over at UC Riverside. And he was talking about how we have hundreds of tons of tomatoes just going to waste, being disked under to compost for next season because there's not enough labor to actually pick the crops Mm -hmm. and how a lot of the more high value crops like almonds and grapes tend to pay a slightly higher rate. And so it's causing this siphoning effect uh, with the labor. Uh, And with that issue in mind on for the large scale farming, is this another sort of positive for people trying to get it on the local scale? Well, I mean, you can say it's a positive or a negative. It, it cuts both ways. Uh, the, the thing with mechanization is, if you look at the topography in San Diego County, our land is not mechanizable. I mean, there is hard, very little mechanization that you can implement here. I know there is efforts in the, in the Salinas Valley, and a lot of the, the, uh, the labor required, you know, with tomato. I mean, the tomato harvester made a huge difference in California with the tomato, with the processing tomato industry. But there is no way you can mechanize, say, heirloom tomato production because I mean that is such a delicate product that it, that, that 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 it is based on the skills of not only the grower but the picker. You know, you gotta be able to pick it pretty much with uh, with silk hands. Otherwise, you know, all, I joke with a grower, you know, in Carlsbad about his heirloom tomatoes uh, and the fact that I tell him, hey, you look at them and they split. You know, if you pick and vine right, so there is no way you're gonna mechanize that. There is no way you're going to mechanize some of the other crops, like say dragon fruit, some of these smaller specialty crops. So yes, I mean mainstream crops that are grown in larger scale in some specific areas. I mean we, we know about the the, 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 the mid plains, you know, the corn, the soybean, the the wheat, the, the sugar cane, and all those things are highly mechanized crops, but they grow expanses of land. Same thing with lettuce and, uh, and say, strawberries uh, in, in the Salinas Valley. And, and they are working on trying to, on robotics or picking strawberries. And they are going to make a huge difference in terms of, of cutting on the labor requirement for those crops. But it's going to be specific to some crops. 
and uh, and our food uh, system or in our diet is so diverse that labor is still going to be a huge part of uh, of what we do. I mean, of, of 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 what we do, especially in San Diego County, because of of the uh, parcel sizes, topography, and uh, and the types uh, of crops that we grow. Hmm, very interesting. Well, uh, the last interview as well, I invited him and thought about the creation of a sort of a roundtable discussion. And I think at the next webinar that we do, we're going to invite uh, Paul Watson uh, from a community nonprofit. And eventually, I want to build up enough of these guests to eventually have a roundtable to really start to tackle some of these issues that we've all sort of been noticing with the food system. And having someone like you who really understands and has the pulse on the business and the regulatory side. We have Richard from UCR who really understands the perspective of the farmer. And then we have Paul Watson who has the perspective of the community. And I guess I'd like to invite you right here and now to be a part of that round table to kind of hammer out some thoughts and solutions uh, for these issues and try to come up with something that is that aforementioned social, environmental, and fiscally sustainable way of doing our food systems. Does that sound, sound like something you'd be interested in? Yeah, I'd love to participate. Oh, fantastic. Um, well, it's been really great talking to you. Uh, I forgot to put a clock near me, so I have no idea if we're over the time or under the time. Do you have a clock near you? What time is it? 7.41. 7.41? Oh, well, we went over a little bit, I think. Let's see, this started at what, seven? So we were supposed to go till 7.20. So we blew through our music and we're currently cutting into our next presentation. That's okay. I think it's Will and I think he's gonna be teaching us how to cook with some mushrooms. Uh, it's been such a pleasure having you here today and I cannot wait until we have you back again. Yeah, same here. Pleasure, thanks for the invite. Awesome. And uh, uh, go yeah. buy it, San Diego Grown, try, be adventurous, buy unusual stuff. They say if there is a fruit grown anywhere in the world, you will find it in San Diego. Uh, so the, the, rare, the California rare fruit growers is a great way to connect to exotic fruits and, uh, and plants and, um, and patronize local farmers markets and uh, yeah, support our local farmers. Well, there we go. I'll put that down in the chat. And then we usually get at least over 100 people who have been watching these webinars in the coming weeks afterwards. So. We'll definitely post it in the description there as well. Thank you so much for visiting us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Back to you, Thank Lindsay. You. Same here. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, I think it is about time for Will to present. Um, if you can go ahead and make Will a co-host, we could go ahead and start that segment. Um, so Will today, he is an undergraduate student at UCSD and he helps out a lot with Rogers Urban Farm Lab. And he also um, works with UC Global Food Initiative. He was a fellow there. And um, Will's the one that I was talking about earlier that works a lot with the mushroom program and mushroom research. And he is looking to start a business growing mushrooms from composted coffee grounds. So plays into all these sustainable agriculture initiatives. And today he's gonna to be talking to you about cooking mushrooms and what you can do at home with them. So once we have, we can just make Will a co-host and we'll hand it off. Mm -hmm. Let me go make sure this is happening. Yeah. All right, can everyone hear me and see me? Yeah, you're good. All right, awesome. Thank you for introducing me, Lindsay, and very awesome presentation, Mr. Lobo. I've really enjoyed it, very interesting, as especially as someone who is interested, interested in starting my own small farm, uh, small farm growing mushrooms. So very interesting to hear that. I really enjoyed that. So let's get into learning how to cook some mushrooms. So I have these oyster mushrooms that I grew at the campus farm, the Rogers Urban Farm Lab. So we have some gray oysters right here. It's a pretty big one. And we also have some special ones. These are some pink oyster mushrooms. So I'll show you a couple different techniques to 
prepare these different types. Um, so yeah, we'll start with the gray oyster just because I have it on the uh, on the cutting board at the moment. So you want to go ahead and you want to go ahead and cut off this stem base. There's usually a little bit of attached substrate, so there's a little bit of straw that's still on there. So just chop that off. It's also pretty hard, and so it's a little more chewy. So just remove that good old half inch. And so I don't know if people have watched my previous live streams, but you can actually take the stem butt, tear it up into a few pieces or cut it up, and then wrap it in some cardboard that you soak in hot water. So that basically pasteurizes it, removes most of the bacteria or any mold. So you can wrap these little nuggets up and basically create your own um, oyster mushroom culture. So you can reuse these. You can take mushrooms that you buy from, say, the grocery store and then take them home, eat them, but also propagate them. So, so what, mushrooms are kind of cool in that they kind of have a grain. They're kind of like wood, so you can kind of like tear them in a direction that's parallel to the gills. So you can actually, you don't even have to use a knife. You can just start shredding these pieces just like that. And so this also allows you to kind of control the, uh, the texture of the mushrooms that you want to cook. So you can get long stringy pieces, long stringy pieces. So these will be a little bit more like noodly, especially since you're not cutting the fibers in any way. If you wanted to cut these finer and give it a more, uh, yeah, more fine texture, you just take, take your knife and cut that, but you can just shred it as so. And a few pieces like that, just tear it. So you can actually see there's the gills, individual gills. So right now there's probably a, thousands of spores coming off this thing. So you keep shredding it down. And also a lot of people like to like rinse all their produce before they, um, before they cook their food. So I usually don't recommend that with mushrooms, but based on the technique I'll show you, it's actually kind of a benefit, especially if you use the technique that I'm going to use because it helps to wet the pre wet the mushrooms. So you don't have to add any water to the pan later. Just keep shredding that. Just, um, a chunky piece, so you can take that and cut it a couple times with some smaller pieces. Try that out. But so the pink oyster actually is a little bit more chewy. It has a little bit more of a it's a little bit more of a tough mushroom. So I think a better technique would actually be to cut it. Um, let's see here. You want to cut it perpendicular to the perpendicular to the direction of the gill. So that'll make the um, fibers of the mushroom nice and short. So that'll help you um, be able to chew it a little more. It'll break up in your mouth a little easier as you grind it with your teeth. So just, these kind of grow in a bit of a bouquet. So it's a little harder to remove the stem, but it kind of looks like a bunch of shelves packed close together. And while I'm at it, let me hit the stove. Usually turn it up to like a medium heat just to get the pan hot nice and fast. Goes to the side. So yeah, so that's a nice single oyster mushroom, pink oyster mushroom. Almost looks like a coral, I guess. So this is a really interesting mushroom. And unfortunately, it doesn't keep the... Uh, that nice pink color as it cooks, but we'll just take these and we'll, so we'll slice them across the grain of the mushroom. As you noticed before, we took the gray oyster and we just peeled it, excuse me, we just peeled it along the direction of the grain. So that leaves nice long fibers. So that'd give it a little bit more of a chewy texture. And that's a little bit better since the gray oyster is a little softer. It cooks down a lot better than the pink oyster. So I want to cut this into small pieces. So 
So you can kind of do the same thing with the pink oyster. It's a little shorter though. It doesn't get as quite as tall as the, um, as the gray oyster, but you can definitely peel it a little bit, but it's definitely a lot stronger. You can definitely, it definitely has quite a different texture when you eat it. So definitely recommend cutting it, um, cutting it, uh, a lot or yeah, perpendicular to the grain and cut into fewer small pieces. So that tends to help cooking. So I think the pan is just about ready. So what I do is, is you take the take your mushrooms and just throw them into the pan. And then you're gonna want to add, I don't know, just a little bit of just a little bit of water, not too much. I would say one or two ounces, one or two ounces per pan is typically a good amount. What you're trying to do is basically lightly steam the mushrooms just enough so that all the, um, all the air pockets inside the structure of the mushroom get filled with that steam. And so they get saturated with water. And so that basically allows the heat to penetrate a little deeper and faster into the, um, into the mushroom. So that helps cook it a little faster. So, as you also noticed, I also didn't add any oil to the pan yet. And so you want to do the, you want to hold off on adding the oil because otherwise the, the mushrooms would just absorb that oil into the pores and then you'd, you'd have to keep adding oil to the pan and your mushrooms would eventually get just saturated with oil. And you don't want that because, you know, mushrooms are a very healthy food and so you want to keep your, keep your mushrooms as low in, low in fats as possible. Got another one on this. I'll just rip this small one up, throw it in there. And so, yeah, you only need to really do that for a minute to 30 seconds of steaming. I don't know if you can see that on camera, but they, the mushrooms have taken on a, almost a translucent, a translucent color. And they've, you can clearly see that they're pretty saturated with water. Let me move these ones out of the way. So once, once they look like that, you can just take off the cover and then begin to evaporate some of that water. And then I'll go ahead and add a couple tablespoons of oil just to help uh, the browning process along. So I'm gonna go find a spoon real quick so I can stir this. So wood spoon, I haven't added any spices yet. I'll probably add some, I like to add garlic salt. It's probably my favorite thing to season mushrooms, salt and pepper, also a good one. A lot of people also like to saute with butter instead of oil because it tastes better. Um, I typically do that if I'm making like an omelet or something. And so another thing, yeah, you can see that the pink oysters have kind of turned a um, move out of the light, kind of turned like this orange, kind of kind of like a salmony color. Uh, and so I, I typically like. I'll throw uh, the sauteed mushrooms in just about anything. I'll put it in a quesadilla, eat it with some pasta. Uh, very, very versatile. Since mushrooms don't really have, especially oyster mushrooms, they don't really have a strong flavor on their own. So they typically just um, take on the flavor of whatever you're cooking them in, and they kind of add a little bit of, a little bit of texture to your meal. And that's usually a good substitute for uh, uh, meat. And mushrooms actually are a very high percentage of protein, up to 20 to 30% in some species. So it's a very good and sustainable source of protein.
Hold on, I hear a little bit. All right, so we're almost ready. Most of that water is evaporated. And so once that happens, um, the mushrooms will start to brown and saute a little bit more. And so at this point, you're basically just looking for the color. Um, just cook them to however golden brown you like them. And usually at this point, I'll grab the worth more. Got the garlic salt, not paid for by Lari's or whatever or anything. Put a little bit of that in there. So yeah, these were grown at the grown at the UCSD campus at the Rogers Urban Farm. And so one thing I what I really like about the local area is the uh, the microclimate is fantastic for growing mushrooms and only mushrooms are our, our normal plant-based crops don't do nearly as well as our mushrooms just because we get a lot of the um we get a lot of the marine layers so we have a lot of overcast a lot of the day and it also we also receive um lower temperatures as a result so plants don't really like this especially during the summertime but mushrooms seem to love it so we've been able to get um, mushrooms fruiting in a completely unclimate controlled greenhouse in the middle of summer here in San Diego. So it's pretty advantageous in that you don't really need to invest a whole lot or spend a lot of energy doing like air conditioning or anything. So you're definitely working working with the land a little bit more. Almost ready. Almost ready. They definitely shrunk in size quite a bit. That's another thing. If you have mushrooms, you can add um, you can add a lot to the pan. It'll definitely uh, it'll definitely shrink down and compress quite a bit. So these are almost ready. I'll probably want to cook those a little bit more, get them a little more brown. Let's see. All right, so pretty much there. I think I'll call it right there. I've actually never experimented with the stem butts with the pink oyster. So maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that. And maybe next week we can do an update video and we will and we'll update you on how this goes. We're going to use the same technique that we used in our previous live stream. So if you want to see that, check it out or see how we did that, check that out. And then next week, come back and we can take a look at what this looks like. So I'm gonna go ahead and chop this into some smaller pieces. And then I'll find some, go find a cardboard box or something and I'll wrap it up. So yeah, that's it. That's our result. Nice, perfectly browned mushrooms and nicely seasoned. So yeah. Thank you everyone for tuning in and watching. I think uh, I'm gonna cook these into my dinner right now. And then of course I'll go and go and work on these as well. But thank you very much for watching and I will hopefully see you next week. All right, so um, my Wi-Fi cut out, so I don't think I can share my screen anymore, but 
I would just like to say thank you to everyone who has joined in today. There's a lot of really good links in the chat and there's a good question in the Q&A, so please go ahead and check that out. Oh, I think I could start my video now. Okay, perfect, hello. Um, yeah, so as I said, go to the chat. There's a lot of good links and we'll be sure to post that in the YouTube video when we post that as well. That's gonna be Rogers Urban Farm Lab on YouTube. And then um, for, if you wanna learn more information about Rogers Urban Farm Lab, you could go ahead and check us out on Facebook as well. We have a Facebook page, just search up Rogers Urban Farm Lab and you'll be sure to find us. And then um, we'll post every single link that we've mentioned here in the bio. And I think that is everything for today. Thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great summer and a great weekend, staying healthy and positive, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.